Welcome and thank you for listening. The title of this talk is Vardenkar, the ancient science of out of body soul projection. The ancient science of out of body soul projection or soul travel, or Tusa travel, meaning soul, goes back way before any time in human history. Um, it's the natural method of soul leaving its body and returning back to the Godhead. Contrary to common belief, the astral body or astral projection is not soul um, or the Tuza. Soul is an eternal, is the eternal God self. It has no beginning nor ending. And it is in it maintains its individuality. It's very um really impossible to accurately talk about soul, but we can experience it through a series of spiritual exercises. I will say a little bit briefly about soul. Soul is our true self. When soul goes into the lower worlds of duality, uh, including the astral plane and the physical plane, soul takes on various various bodies or sheaths, which inter allow it to interact within the lower worlds. These sheaths, um, for example, the etheric body, the mental body, the causal body, the astral body, and of course the physical body are all needed while we're interacting here. However, soul, being eternal, being the God self, has the ability to leave the body or project into any of the planes from, from, the, from the physical all the way in to the very God worlds, which are beyond the etheric body. And it was going into the fifth region, or the Atma Lok, and then there are regions above that, the 6th plane, 7th plane, 8th plane, ninth plane, etc. And I, I'll go into that in more detail later. Vardenkar has had many names, but it has always been the path of returning to God via out-of-body soul projection, or soul travel. This has always been the way that man returns to God. God does not descend into the human body or into the human state of consciousness but we must leave as soul and return into these higher states which are ironically we're exper we're always there simultaneously in other words time and space are an illusion so we're not really traveling it's sort of a misnomer thus the term soul projection is probably more accurate than the term soul travel or or Tusa travel. We Tusa travel or soul travel when we're in the lower worlds. Um, I guess you could argue that, but in the higher worlds, we simply place our attention, we are, our awareness. Thus, some call Vardenkar the path of total awareness. There's always a plus factor. So there's always another plane, another... Um, understanding. We don't seek knowledge in the end, but we seek wisdom. And the qualities of soul and the qualities of spirit, um, wisdom, power, love, wisdom, power, and freedom. Of these, love is the greatest of all. But it is not the karmic love or the attached love or emotional love of the astral plane. Or the, or the attached love of the causal plane, the karmic love of the causal plane, it is divine love, it is unconditional love. And I'm, I'm going to go into a little bit later about spirit, uh, the Varden appearing as light and sound, because this is the this divine um, essence that flows from God. And we can tune into this, and we can actually ride the, re the, re the ascending wave back to the heart of God. Now, soul itself is a very um, 
seldom understood, it's really our true self, is seldom understood by those who are not, actually it's never understood by those who are not self-realized. Many claim to be self-realized, but upon further examination they're not. Um, they're, they're either at the physical or the astral, occasionally the mental plane. But these are not self. These are not planes of the self. These are, these are planes of the various bodies. And so, soul itself is eternal in nature. It has no beginning or ending. The astral body, on the other hand, is finite, although it can last a long time. The causal body has an even longer lifespan. The mental body has an even longer lifespan. And the etheric body, which is the subconscious or primitive mind, it's like the high mental, has an even longer, longer lifespan. But all of these lower planes, and I'll, I'll go into more detail, um, are all finite in nature. And so soul reincarnates in these various physical embodiments, but also it reincarnates in the astral plane at times, which is much nicer, much larger. But soul contains certain qualities. Um, that this, These qualities are not soul, but they are qualities that soul possesses, um, seeing, knowing, being. Soul has um, direct perception. It doesn't require a mind when it's in the higher worlds. In, it, in its natural state, soul does not require a mind to perceive. It doesn't think. It has this direct perception, has this beingness, this seeing and this knowing. Um, I am that I am is often cried when someone reaches the, well, actually they cried, it's, it's expressed when, when a soul reaches the soul plane or the Atma Lok and meets Sat Nam, the first true manifestation of God in the pure positive, the first of the pure positive God worlds or true pure positive God worlds. Now, in order to understand, um, what I'm talking about here, there's probably some background that needs to be filled in unless you're familiar with Vardenkar. Um, Vardenkar, like I said, has had many, many names throughout history. Um, from 1965 until not roughly 1971, Vardenkar was known as Ekankar under Sri Paul Twitchell. Paul Twitchell is very controversial in some people's minds. Um, but actually he was a Varden master. And to make a long story short, when he translated, he never appointed anyone to take over as the new living Varden master, um, or Ek, Ek master, if you want to call it that. Um, he made a list of people, but he never actually appointed anyone. And so, um, Darwin Gross was, was picked by the board of directors. And so the, the Ekankar that exists after 1971, ha has been a, um, a religious type organization. It's been a, a group that did not have a master, even under Darwin, <clears throat> who did attempt to, to keep Paul G's um, requests alive of not being a religion and following the teachings. He couldn't do it. He, he had tried to, but he was only a fifth initiate, so he wasn't capable. But anyway, moving on, Barton Cars had many names. Uh, throughout history, many different masters. And it's an ancient science. Ancient, it goes way back past time. Um, it can be traced thousands and thousands of years and, and back. But again, not, not through the name itself, but through the out-of-body soul projection or Tuza travel aspect of it. Um... Every spiritual path that's ever been worth its salt or had any kind of value has been a offshoot of Vardenkar or a, it has taken the certain qualities that Vardenkar had. In fact, all paths are, are offshoots of, of the original teachings. Um, so Vardenkar, the Varden is ancient and Vardenkar is ancient in that it is the path of, of soul projection where one leaves their body 
through through the ins inner instructions and outer instructions. And they travel through these various planes. They go to these various golden wisdom temples, which are run by by different Varden masters, um, such as Rami Nuri, um, Gopal Das, Fubi Quants. Um, there, there are many of them. And, and these masters teach... Um, in these temples. And these are the highest teachings of soul returning to God. They don't revolve around um, the utilization of power and all these other things. Those things may be learned inadvertently, but they're not. The emphasis is now on reaching self-realization and, and God-realization and, and inevitably becoming a, becoming a conscious co-worker. A conscious coworker with the Hugh Ray or God. He raised Vardenkar's name for God. So that soul may return as a citizen or and take on these various spiritual mission its spiritual mission, um, which can be any number of things. Angels, cherubs, um, masters. There there are many, many, many spiritual missions that soul may choose um, in order to serve consciously. The key here is consciously. So until we wake up, until we reach this stage in the higher worlds, soul uh, is sort of watching this video game with these various lower bodies um, who are mechanical. They're basically mechanical in nature, including the mind. And so there's very little that's understood by man about this and a lot of mythology and... and um, it's, there's a tremendous amount of confusion out there, and I can see why. Um, so we learn to leave our body and project. Now, it's a science. Vardenkar is a science because there's specific methods of doing this under specific conditions. The good news is it's not something where you have to quit your job, leave your family, and move out in the middle of nowhere. This can be done in the Western world or, or any kind of uh, so-called civilized world. Um, the spiritual exercises themselves require, uh, at minimum, about thirty minutes per day, which most people can do if they if they just adjust their schedules. Um, some want to do them twice a day um, for thirty minutes each time. Now you can go longer if something's happening. But that's up to you. But they're not like in the Eastern paths, often hours and hours of meditation per day. So that's not required in order to reach these these illuminated or elevated states of awareness and consciousness. Um, it's a science in that the various planes are mapped out. Now there's a limit to how much can be mapped out, but it's like any road map where you have there's a lot of detail that is left out in a map. Um, but the idea is that you can see where you're, the general direction you're going in and what cities you're going to be hitting and plan the trip. Now, the inner master is the personalization of spirit. And the living Varden master is a, the personification of spirit. On the inner, on the outer, it's a human being like myself, who um, writes books, gives talks, does discourses. And so this is something that's that's actually kind of fascinating that throughout history, the Varden has used various embodiments on the path that are called the living Varden master. And these different embodiments are all of the Varden. They're all for the body of the Varden. They all have different personalities, different bodies, different cultures, different skin colors. And they're, um, they all share this consciousness, um, but they're very, very different in personality and background. And, and um, these various aspects are really irrelevant as far as the Varden is concerned, but people get caught up in this stuff, you know, and it's very sort of amusing. People are so, most people are so materialistic that they, they can only see the covering, the the outer garment. It's like um, 
Rumi wrote a poem. I don't have all the details on it, but it was, I think, it was something about a secret garden. And the wall that surrounded this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful garden. And the gardener that took care of this garden said that he had this wall around it that was all beat up and it was crumbling and dirty and vines were growing everywhere. And that it kept the profane, the eyes of the profane, from um, from coming in and, and, and going into the sacred garden. And so it is with the Vardan teachings. People that are looking for physical perfection or they're looking for mental perfection or they're looking for all their T's to be dotted, to, to be crossed and the I's to be dotted, um, often uh, they don't have the ears to hear or the eyes to see the, the message, which is that soul, via the path of soul projection, the ancient science of soul projection, um, via the sound current and the initiations and master, um, can return to God in a single lifetime and gain God realization. See, they don't see that. They see everything else but that. And so it's true that there's nothing that keeps us in our body except our own foolish beliefs. And the same holds true for those who do astral projection or do or move into the astral plane. There's nothing that keeps them from moving beyond the astral plane except their their lack of awareness, their lack of understanding, and perhaps their foolish beliefs. Um, and so it's an ancient science, and it takes discipline like any other science. It takes time. But not so much time and energy that that you cannot live your life, which is really that would live your life as a as a person. You know, you don't have to throw out your life and get this new life. Um, but you can you can keep your job and you can keep your family and you can keep your house. And if you have a boat or or two cars or whatever, those those things don't have to be given up for for a little sack and a. In a dream, you know, go to some place in India and live on, under the stars and feel like you're freezing to death and starving. Uh, all those things, those extremes are not necessary. Vardenkar is the middle path. You're walking the middle path. Now, what you do need to develop at some point is detachment. Now, there are five... I'm going through a lot of this really fast. Um, sort of a, a little bit of a crash course. There are five passions of the mind that the negative power, the negative power's job is to keep us in these lower worlds, which are like a schoolhouse. So the five passions of the mind are lust, anger, greed, attachment, and vanity. And of these, probably the most insidious is um, vanity. Now, vanity has two faces. It has the face of, of you know, when you're vain, somebody's vain and they don't want to... Um, you know, they're like poo-pooing everything and they have really strong opinions and they're they're basically just saying, I'm, I know what I'm doing, they don't. Um, well, everybody knows kind of what vanity is. It's an excessive um, infatuation, I guess you'd call it, or a, a preoccupation with the little self, with, with the self. Excessive. You have to have some ego, but it's excessive. Now, the other side of the coin with vanity is those that put themselves down to the extreme. Again, obsession or overemphasis on the little self. And they'll say things like, oh, I could never find God. Um, I'm not good enough. I'm, oh, I'm just a little um, old lady. Or I'm just a little, I'm a man. I'm just a young guy. I, I don't know anything about this stuff. I'm not, you know, worthy of God. I'm not worthy of this. I can't do this. It's too too difficult, you know, somebody that's more advanced than me, I'm not advanced, I'm not, you know, and it appears that they're, um, this is called self-defecation, uh, or a low, excessively low opinion of oneself, and so we have to walk that middle path, and surrender, and so few, uh, it's amazing how few can do this, uh, but there is a way, and that is through a tremendous love and desire for God, and for truth. If one loves God and truth, 
more than they love their petty self and more than they love the things of this world, they will find a way to overcome the various obstacles that will come in their path. And these obstacles are there to test us. And so, this being said, um, most of the people listening to this will not even be interested because it's too much trouble. And they're, and they're thinking, well, what is it in it for me? Do I, get, do I get to buy another boat? Or do I get to buy a better car? Or do I get to have um, better sex with my wife? Or better sex with a girlfriend? Or find a maid? Or get more money? Or get a better job? Or um, friends like me more? You know, they're thinking in terms of the things of this world. Or do I get to look really cool in front of people and people really like me? Um, do I get to develop psychic powers or ma do magic tricks? Uh, things like this. And, and Vardenkar is not about that at all. Um, there are 32 facets of Vardenkar, which may involve some of, some of things um, such as seeing into the future, seeing into the past. Um, the Varden Vidya. Uh, there's many aspects of it, but these are these take a big back seat to the to experiencing these different planes and gaining the wisdom, the love, fr freedom, the wisdom, power, and freedom, and love that's necessary as we move along the path. Now, the light and sound is this wave that comes from the Hure, from the heart of God which issues out of the 12th plane, and there's planes beyond the 12th. By the way, these are not dimensions. Forget about anything that people talk about, dimensions, the 10th dimension, the 7th dimension, the 5th dimension. That ha that's not nothing to do with these planes. Um, this light and sound is the Varden. It's the word. It's the, it's the force. It's the power. It contains love, wisdom, power, freedom, and, of course, beyond that, and it, it manifests these various planes. And each plane has a, a different vibration. As they go down, they become lower and lower in vib vibratory rate. And each one is an entire, a huge... Well, when you're in the higher worlds, there's no time and space. But these are our true homes, the higher worlds. The soul plane and above is the true abode of soul. The lower worlds, when the when the spiritual force, the light and sound, goes below the soul plane, it splits into duality. It splits into positive and negative and neutral, like a prism. Like when you take prism, like a glass prism or a, a any device that fractures light into various colors. Um, we've all seen the the rainbow effect, and so it's like the white light breaks up into these various streams of energy. You have the positive, negative, and neutral forces, and many sub-forces. Um, and this is where it gets really confusing with all these gods and demigods and sub-gods. And if you look at some of the paths like Hinduism and look at some of the ancient cultures where they had um, various gods, um, god of goddess of destruction, goddess of birth, uh, you know, all these different energies that were represented as people or, or gods, individualizations of these forces. None of that is God. It's simply the, these fractured currents that are being... People are trying to express these. Um, all of this is temporal. It's all part of the lower worlds. Not that it's bad, but the lower worlds are basically a prison for soul. They're a cell, <laughs> or a series of cells. And so what soul does is through the path of farting car, through the path of out-of-body soul projection, it works with the master, who's the personification of the hire and of the varden, but for a particular purpose, the purpose of bringing souls back, bringing soul back into the ecstatic states, the, the states... Um, beyond time and space in the, in the the soul plane or the fifth region or Atma Lok. It's got several names. 
and it goes beyond this into the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, and so on. The 12th being the where the Hure, or God, actually dwells in the ocean of love and mercy. The ocean of love and mercy is this endless, um, seemingly endless, beyond description. It can only be experienced. And this is true of all the higher planes. The Anami Lok is very, very high. And these planes are indescribable. They're so beautiful. Beyond words, beyond emotions. These are the true pl places where soul desires to dwell. And once we return to these planes through out-of-body travel, well, I have to say, we have this dual awareness where we're able to function in the lower worlds while we're simultaneously in these aware of these higher planes. And this is what the Varden Masters do. This is why they're so different from the typical so-called masters and gurus who don't dwell in these high planes. This is why they're not interested in all the things and the magic tricks and all this stuff, because that's not their job to be interested. Now, there are what's called mystery schools, and then, of course, there's religions and philosophies and all these different teachings that are all, for the most part, based upon the lower worlds. And Saul spends a huge amount of time studying on these different paths the mystery schools are sort of like the higher end of the... They go into the different mysteries, the lunar mysteries, the solar mysteries, um, mysteries of nature. Um, religion is a, a, low, a lower consciousness generally, and you've got philosophies, and, and there's really a path for each soul at, a, at that particular time in their incarnations. Now, reincarnation is a very important... Um, very important to understand that soul while soul is eternal these lower bodies are not and so in order to gain enough experience and because soul is constantly generating karma um, and, and working out karma from, from being in these lower worlds where there's, a, there's this cause and effect you know every action there's a reaction soul gets caught up in this karmic these karmic cycles with the lower bodies and so we reincarnate, and there's what's called the Wheel of 84. And most souls end up going through millions and millions of incarnations. It's almost beyond, um, staggers the mind. The reason most people don't remember this is because there's this tremendous mercy, and we're, for the most part, forget this long history of, of our incarnations. Also, the astral body... The various lower lower bodies have cycles of, of birth and death, but they're much longer. And so most people have a very limited memory span, which is actually good. Because if, if you could remember thousands and thousands of lives, let alone millions of lives, uh, and it was at an emotional level um, in detail... It would be very difficult, be impossible to live your life day by day. I mean, you know how people have problems with their childhood, had some kind of drama and, or dr a dramatic experience, negative experience that was very difficult. Well, imagine, you know, having 10,000 lifetimes where you remember all these dramatic experiences. Um, it would be too, it would be very confusing and very disheartening for most people. Um, so now, eventually, you do start to remember your lives, but you remember them from a higher place, from the soul plane and above. Um, you remember what, what you can handle. What you can handle comes down into the physical planes. Now, there are Akashic records on the soul, on the causal plane, I'm sorry, of past lives, and that can be read to a degree. Um, and I've done that, and a lot of people have done that. It's pretty common. Um... The astral plane is the plane of emotion. It's an actual plane. There's many subplanes within the astral, thus giving birth to this whole uh, New Age dimension theories where they talk about the fifth dimension, the fourth dimension. A lot of that is just simply subregions of the astral plane. Astral travel is often confused with soul travel or soul projection, um, astral projection, 
um, astral travel. People confuse the astral body with the soul body. Because the astral body is sometimes called the light body. Sometimes it sparkles like millions of stars. And it certainly lives longer. So there's this misunderstanding of the whole astral plane itself. And people begin to think that these different regions within the astral are actually different planes. And they start maiming them as dimensions. And then they get into the causal and they start maiming them as dimensions. And so you have all this confusion because there's no universal terminology. And so what one person calls a plane, I would call a dimension. And one person says the fifth region, and I would call it the mid-astro. I'm just giving you an example. I'm not saying that's true. But um, it leads to some pretty confusing conversations that people have. And somebody will say soul when they really are talking about the astral body. And then I say soul, and they say, oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. I've already done that. And I mentioned going into the fifth region or the soul plane. And they're thinking of the of the mid-astral. And they say, of course, I'm already there. I've already had that happen to me. You know, you mentioned self-realization, and the, which takes place on the soul plane or the fifth region beyond time and space. And they say, yes, of course, you know. And they're talking about the causal. Um, I mean, stuff like this happens all the time. So it takes a tremendous amount of humility. It reminds me of it reminds me of when someone comes to the master and they have a cup of water and it's stale and stagnant and all putrefied and it's really you know gross filled with bacteria and stuff and they want more water and the master says first you have to empty your cup and if the person says well i don't want to empty my cup cuz if I empty my cup, how do you know you're going to give me water? What if I empty my cup and there's no water? You have no water. Then I'll, I'll die in the middle of the desert. I'm not going to empty my cup, but give me water. Well, if your cup is full, um, there's nothing the master can do. And so this is where humility comes in. And most people, frankly, their their cup is so filled with what they think they know and their opinions and their dogmatic beliefs that there's nothing that can be done for them because they've already made up their mind what's true, what's not true, what they want. And they want it in a particular way. Like some people will say, well, I want to travel into these different planes. I want to find God, but I want to do it through Jesus. Only Jesus, you know. And um, that's it. I've made up my mind. Or I want to find it, but I want to find it through the angels. Only the angels, you know. Um... And so people have these very specific, uh, reminds me of these um, personal sections of, you know, where they have to be between 34 and, and 40 and they have to be a professional and they have to have, you know, athletic build about about five foot five to five foot eight, you know, and, and it's on and on and on and on. And it's like nobody, nobody quite gets there. And then even if they do fill the description, they're not compatible, <laughs> you know. They have all these features, but it's not the right person for the, for the person that placed the ad. It's like that. People are like that sometimes, and it's there's nothing I can do. I just it's, it's nothing you can do. They usually don't even contact us because it's simply they're just not ready. They don't have the eyes to see or the ears to hear. So it takes somebody who's very special in the sense that they're that they desire God more than they than they're attached to all the conditions and the dogmatic beliefs and the cherished beliefs and all of the stuff that they've been hanging on to for dear life or, or been hanging on to close to. Usually it's an individual that's been beat up and had all these disappointments and life has been difficult and hard for them. And then they come and they're willing to let go. As Sri Paul Twitchell used to say, Life is difficult for those that pick and choose. And the master offers these gifts to the to the student, a chila. And if the chila says, well, I'll take that one, but I don't want that one. I don't want that one. I don't want that, but I'll take that. Or I'll take half of that. Um, life becomes very difficult. There's always been a way back to God. 
we've always had the presence of the master waiting for us. You know, the master has always been with us on the inner. And the personality doesn't really matter because it's always the individualized expression of of the hero or God allowing soul to take a shortcut. The ocean of love and mercy, the hero in all its <clears throat> compassion offers soul a way to not go through this long, long process of perfection through the wheel of 84. This long grill. However, it sets up a system where it's automatic. And it knows that soul's soul will eventually return to it. It's just a matter of, of when. So the hero doesn't have a concept of time. There is no time. So whether it takes a billion years or it takes a hundred million years or it takes a million years or it takes twenty years or, or ten years, um, you know, question is, well, so what? But then. Everything exists within the here and now. Everything exists within eternity. And if we're going to put things off, you know, for another day, another day, another year, another life, what guarantee do we have that we're ever going to find it? Well, eventually we will. But when? It could you know, it could be 100 million years from now. So the question is, if we don't take the opportunity now, what guarantee do we have that we'll get another chance in the next lifetime? You know, that's the that's the... The crux of the matter. You know, what guarantee do we have? Absolutely none. Um, so, in its tremendous compassion, the Hure offers soul always out of this tremendous love and compassion and the fact that we are in these higher planes now, but we're unaware of them. And I know some people are saying, oh, I'm aware of it. I know all about that, you know. Well, I mean, I hate to say it, but most people that talk like that don't have any clue what I'm talking about at all. Um, they're getting the lower planes confused with the higher planes. And I, and I apologize if I'm coming off... Um, appearing arrogant or appearing whatever you want to call it. But that's just the truth. Um, that I see so many people that they just poo-poo it and they say, oh yeah, you know, we're all in God. We're all part of God. There's no reason to struggle. There's no reason to seek. We're already there, so let's not even worry about it. Let's go out and, and enjoy some popcorn and a movie. And... Um, don't worry about it. Just don't worry about it, you know. Well, there's nothing wrong with enjoying popcorn in a movie. I'm not d trying to deny you any of that. But the real question is, well, okay. So what happens to these people? Well, reincarnation and karma. I'm not trying to scare anybody. But you can only, you can't take anything with you except your your state of consciousness. You can't take anything with you except your state of consciousness. That's all you can take. You can have all the money in the world. You can have all the things in the world. You can be the smartest. You can think you're the smartest whip in the world, the smartest person in the world. Lots of brain power. You can memorize all this stuff. Have all this money, all this power, all these people that love you. All that stuff. Great body, wonderful mate, blah, 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 blah. It's like we're actors in a play. And when the play is over, we walk away and the set's taken down and we're no longer that role. And all is left is soul, our eternal self. And our state of consciousness. And these states exist here and now. Yes, they do. But we need to unfold into them and become aware of them. And that's the, that's the problem. Or not the problem, but that's the, the situation. Is that we have to unfold. And this is done through a series of initiations. And we go to these various golden wisdom temples where various masters are in charge. 
and there's a chart on this, and you can, I mean, it's all there. It's not overly complex. Um, we have a website that shows you, um, you can read the Shariat Kihirei's book one and two. And we have all these free audios, and vi you know, videos. Um, and then we have study discourses for those people that want to join. But that's neither here nor there at this point. So there's this, it all comes down to desire, and it all comes down to who's ready and who's not ready. And frankly, most of you are not ready. Now, the fact that you're still listening, you know, indicates that there's a, maybe, maybe there's a more of an interest. But we never twist anybody's arm in Varden. Um, there's all as materials out there that you can look at, um, like I said, lots and lots of videos and audios and um, and free books. And then there's some books that you can get on Amazon that are inexpensive. So um, what I find is that people that join the path on the outer need to really want to join. And not just, you know, half-heartedly. So um, the last thing I want is somebody who's who's very weary of it and you know, um, and then you don't get initiated until after two years of being on the path and you can, and you can, re you have to request after two years of study, you request the, the second initiation. The first initiation takes place during the dream state, uh, usually within the first year. And so I'm sure I left out a whole bunch of stuff. Let's see, Vardenkar, the ancient science of out of body soul projection. Um, what did I forget to say? I'm sure I did. Can't do it in one talk. None of this can be done in one talk. <laughs> well, this was sort of a little crash. Um, I know what I could do. Um, I'm trying to think. Sometimes just words just fall so flat. Um, I will demonstrate the hue. I've done this before. Hugh is an ancient name for God, and we chant this word, and um, now I've got some problems with my lungs, so <laughs> I'm going to chant it shorter than it probably should be chanted, but it's H-U, and it's pronounced Hugh, and I'm going to just do it a few times, and you can do this, um, you close your eyes, sitting in a chair preferably, and you place your attention upon your tisserato, which is between the eyebrows, called the third eye. Take a few deep breaths. And it's best if you don't do this as a prayer. Don't ask for anything uh, materialistic. If you're going to ask for anything, ask to be shown um, thy will. You know, show me thy will, O oh God. Or show me thy will, O oh Hure. Hure is our name for God. It's best if it's done with sincerity and not as a request for for mater anything material. Um, and this is what it sounds like. H U A can also be chanted with the entire word, the H and the U, pronounced at the same time, or one after the other. Hugh. Hugh. H. U. H U We 
we do this for a while and then we fall silent and we listen for a sound and we look for an inner light so that's a simple exercise that you can try there's also a God Worlds chart on the website. By the way, the website is vardenkar.com. V A R D A N K A R.com. And there's also a God Worlds chart. Um, there's actually a couple of them. One is more complicated than the other. But it will give you an idea of the different sounds that can be chanted for the various planes. I hope I didn't overwhelm you. Um, I know this is quite different from probably what you're used to. I will say a couple more brief things. The, for the most part, the problem with religion and metaphysics, and one of the problems with these teachings is that a lot of it is based upon distractions. Most people are looking for entertainment. I mean, the New Age... New Age groups are a good example. There's a lot of people looking for entertainment and sensationalism. They're looking for information about UFOs and space people and all that stuff. And there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with, with that. I mean, per se. I mean, certainly a lot of this exists. I'm not questioning that. But the problem is it's not really spiritual. You know, and people will argue with me all they want. But um, a lot of this is, you know, personality worship. You know, looking to the Palladians or looking to some other group from another race and saying that you saw their saucer or you're communicating with them. That's all fine, but it's not... Um, it won't help you return to God. It might teach you to be more loving. Um, it might show you some really interesting technology, uh, give you a little bit of education about what's happening, perhaps. But people get caught up in these distractions. And also the distraction of trying to make the world into this wonderful place. Not that there's anything wrong with doing good deeds out of, out of pure love unconditionally. Um, the problem is the cow power, the negative power, which desires to keep soul in the lower worlds of time and space is has two sides. And one side we all know is the side of war and destruction and hatred and anger and vengefulness and all these terrible things that we see on Earth now that we have a Kali Yuga or an Iron Age where you just shake your head and you say, how could people be so cruel and mean and heartless? And then you have the other side, which is let's make the earth into a utopia or a beautiful place. And this can be done. We just have to love one another, feed the homeless, you know, give them a place to live, you know, feed the children, give them water, love each other, be kind to one another. These are all positive things. But again, they're not really, they're not spirituality. They're just what a good tenant would do if they were... You know, we're all temporary residents. You know, being a good tenor, being a good citizen of the universe in the physical plane. You know, you obviously don't go around starting wars and killing people. And if you see somebody that's sick, you... Um, these are just being a, a good tenant. They're not, nothing with spirituality, per se. But people get this confused... And you don't serve your, you don't serve bodies, you don't serve people, you serve God consciously, and then if God or the Hure directs you, whatever actions you take in the name of it, in the name of you know without thinking of reward, that happens, and it might involve feeding homeless, it might involve building houses, or or doing these these acts as a channel for God, conscious channel for God. But we need to get out of the lower worlds and reach these elevated states of awareness um, in the God worlds and become self-realized and, and gain Jaivan Mukti or spiritual liberation 
and, and ultimately become God-realized and become masters, when we go toward these things, then we're going to be much, much greater channels than any kind of do-gooding, any kind of like efforts to, to be a good person. It's sort of like likened to being an actor in a play. And, you, you know, people play the bad guy, they play the good guy, they play the neutral person. And it's like people are in this big game. And when you feed somebody food, you know, even if it's out of kindness, it's it's good. But they're going to be hungry again. And they're going to be hungry. And then finally their body will translate. And then it's more incarnations. And so the cow gets people going either in this downward spiral of war and destruction and famine and pollution and and self-destructiveness and hurting others and destroying bodies and hurting bodies and hurting themselves alcohol drugs etc 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 greed um it gets people in that direction or it gets people on the positive side of the cow which is still a negative power which is morality and the idea of doing good works and being righteous and serving people, serving bodies, and trying to make the earth into this paradise or heaven when it's not. So it's like a prison. You have two sides of the prison. You have one side of the prison, everybody's killing each other and hurting each other. And the other side of the prison, everybody's trying to make the prison as nice as possible. You know, like decorating the walls and feeding really good food to the prisoners. And, and um, well, they're both prison. You know, one's a, they're, they may appear to be the, the good side of the prison is not prison and the bad side is prison. But they're both prison. You know, maybe one side the guards are beating everybody up and hurting people. And the other side the prisoners are being really nice and the guards are doing everything they can to make them comfortable and happy. But they're still inside this prison. And so soul in its natural state is um is a happy entity. It's a free it's a free agent for God and it and it clamors to to get out of these lower states in and travel and move into these these higher pure positive states from the fifth region all the way up it wants to go home it wants to experience Jaivad mukti it wants to experience um god realization and beyond and it wants to to touch the hem of god's robe so to speak obviously god is not a man with a robe but it's a freedom of uh, it's a colloquial expression um the hearing itself is unspeakable there's nothing can be said for it. it's neither male nor female um there's really nothing that can be said it has to be experienced this is true of all the higher worlds there's very little that can be said about them the lower worlds as we move up higher become more difficult to speak of it's fairly easy to talk about the astral plane um, the astral plane has many sub-regions. As you move up, it gets more spacious. It gets harder. Oh, I got a dog there <laughs> outside, not mine. Um, as we move out, it gets, it gets uh, more spacious. There's a lot of different states of consciousness on the astral. Um, it's an area where on the lower astral people will see ghosts, poltergeists, like when you get into the super physical lower astral um some of the aliens are working in the in the super physical or astral regions uh, the super physical is simply a, a vibration that's a little bit higher than what we can see it's sort of on the border and it's really just everything is about um in the lower worlds it's about vibration you know like the electromagnetic light spectrum you know when you get to a certain point People, things start to disappear when they go beyond the range of the human eye. They're still there, but they're not... The eye can't see them anymore. You know, with certain colors, when you get into infrared, um, you have to have, like, special cameras or sensors because the eye can't see it. It's not designed to see that particular frequency. And so it's all about frequencies uh, at the in the lower levels. And this is why the scientists keep saying you can't prove it, you can't prove it. Uh, because they're using, you know, they're just using the wrong instruments and the wrong methods. 
which is probably good. If they probably proved it, they probably want to send the military in to take it over or something. I'm sorry, it's a dumb joke, but, um, so, gee, I am digressing here. I'm jumping all over the place. So there's a lot of confusion. And the confusion can be broken through using the methods of Vardenkar, the ancient science of out-of-body soul projection, or soul travel, or Tuza travel, Tuza meaning soul. The only way to break out of this is through um, having your own experiences. And, of course, the reading of the Varden materials make a preparation so you understand what's happening and what's going on and you can use this ancient science like any science it takes effort to apply it, it takes some knowledge but the knowledge itself w w turns into wisdom power love and freedom through the, the these experiences that we have and through the sense of knowing and touching upon these these other planes and touching upon these masters, the Varda masters, the spirit, the true spiritual travelers, who um, who teach on these various golden wisdom temples. You know, and we have Yabal Sakabi, the great Varda master Yabal Sakabi, um, who's in Gar hair. And this is on Earth. And Fubi Quants, um, who's in the Katsapiri Monastery. You know, we have um, Rami Nuri, who's uh, in the super physical Venus. Um, Gopal Das is on the astral plane, the, the Golden Wisdom Temple there, Ascalaposis. And so people study, you know, on the in the dream state usually, but also you can do it during contemplation in these various golden wisdom temples with these various masters. And each one of them, uh, a master can only lead you to wherever he himself or she herself has earned and in, can only lead you to the highest state of consciousness that that master is able to dwell in. So if a master is only able to dwell in the astral plane, you're not going to get... By studying with that master, you're not going to get further than the astral. Um, that's all they can offer you, is whatever they've earned themselves. And so by hanging around or, or spending time in the presence of these various Varden masters, that itself is a huge um, difference between Vardenkar and, and other paths. Other, you know, Vardenkar is not a religion, but other, other systems. So anyway, I am rambling like I sometimes do. So I am going to end this talk. Um, let's say that as soul, uh, I'm always with you. And that um, I will not interfere with your state of consciousness without being given permission. And Baraka Bashad. May the blessings be.